Awesome. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of Growing Strong Product Makers mini conference series. I'm really grateful to Product Board for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts today. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we have a lot to cover, so let's dive right into it. Um, I've kept my slides fairly light and I'll share this with Scott later so you can have it. Um, and we'll also do a little Q&A at the end of the session, but you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have after the session as well. Uh, a little bit about me. I am Priya Bhatia, the Growth PM at Seven Shifts, um, a restaurant labor management software based out of Canada. Uh, we recently raised the Series B and are growing at a fast pace in an intensely competitive landscape. Uh, in my role at Seven Shifts, I'm running ex multiple experiments to drive net MR retention and have learned lo a lot lo along the way um, about product-led growth and experiments, which is what I'll be talking about today. Uh, without further ado, uh, the three things that I hope you can take away from today's session are about what is product-led growth and why it matters, uh, experiments as a tool to drive growth, and also running minimal viable tests and analyzing their results. Okay, so what is product-led growth? Uh, that's become so commonplace in the tech world today. Why are companies like Uber, Airbnb, Atlassian, Facebook hiring growth product managers? To understand this, let's take a step back and understand how this term and role gained so much prominence. Do you remember the days of growth hacking? Uh, typically associated with startups, uh, growth hackers use creative low-cost strategies to help businesses acquire and retain customers quickly so that they can help raise money. Unsurprisingly, the term hacking had this uh, you know, negative connotation and over time, growth hacking just became growth marketing. Uh, growth marketing, on the other hand, used more traditional marketing tools such as SEO, advertising, um, you know, social media to, to bring in more customers. However, as the competition grew more in the technology space, even good marketing meant like spending a lot of dollars to acquire customers who on the other hand did not want to pay as much and wanted to trial the product before you, they made the buy decision. Think about it. When was the last time you bought a product from a salesperson? Uh, buyers want to self-educate now and rather, rather experience the product for themselves before they make the buy decision. That meant the product should be able to sell itself. Enter product-led growth. Product-led growth is a business methodology uh, that basically uh, relies on the product itself to, to acquire, expand, convert, and uh, as well as retain users. Uh, it creates a company-wide alignment across teams from engineering to sales and marketing around the product as the largest source of sustainable growth. Product-led doesn't mean product team-led. It means that all factions of the business come together to make the product experience a compelling buy. The product should have a clearly understood value where the marketing steps in. The product should deliver meaningful value in the shortest possible time, the aha moment, uh, which is where the product and design play a role. The product must also work reliably and predictably. What's a product that doesn't work, right? So high engineering. Uh, interactions beyond the product should also be delightful where, is, where customer success and advocacy play a role. So basically it starts with the product first and the product experience first. There are many PLG companies you would have heard of. Um, Dropbox, Zoom, Slack are some great examples of product-led companies. If you remember how Zoom gained popularity, uh, they allowed 40 minutes of fast free video calling, easy login, you know, quick video calling with a uh, shareable link as against the solutions that we had in the past. You know, they spent very minimal dollars on uh, advertising and uh, marketing prior to 2018 because they believe the product is so good, they, it should be able to sell itself. And that's what happened. Uh, when we all went remote, Zoom became the most popular video calling solution for individuals and companies, just because of how easy to use it was. Zoom is not free, by the way, for enterprises though. They make money out, out of its premium features. So thus you'll observe uh, that PLG companies typically have following characteristics. They are self-serve and easy to use. They, the very first interaction you had with the product was a no-brainer, you know, very intuitive and a breeze to operate. It probably took you only a few minutes to understand the core value of the product and what problem it solved for you. They offer a premium or a, a freemium or a free trial or a combination of the two. 
the idea again is to really get the user in the door in the most frictionless way, deliver value before you can capture value. Before, because they focus on acquiring a larger user base of users, they often have a large number of low paying customers uh, on their lower tiers and, and the companies then work uh, put, put in the work to upgrade them to higher tiers, which makes these companies more money. How does a company become product led though you would ask? Um, of course, like companies don't become product led overnight. Uh, be becoming product led is a process and journey that requires mindset, mindset shift uh, at both the individual and company level. It takes time, effort and commitment, but it's so, so totally worth it. You would also ask me, uh, but Priya, should I care if I'm not the growth PM? I, I would say yes, um, as defined before. PLG is a business methodology that relies on providing a superior user experience that starts with the product and the feature itself. So therefore that's where every PM has a role to play. Where growth PM steps in are to optimize those experiences to improve the metrics of acquisition, adoption, retention, and everything across the customer journey. Now that we've delved a little bit into what is PLG, let's understand how might we drive it. But to be able to drive growth, you first need to understand what is your company's growth model. A growth model, also known as a growth flywheel, is a chosen system or mechanism through which a company earns more revenue or more users over time. In other words, a growth model conveys what works for your company to acquire, activate, activate uh, you know, retain and expand user base. When you deeply understand your user psychology, you get a step closer to the growth to your to uncovering your growth model. If you think about it, growth models are actually a curation of the habit loops that you create around your product for your user. Who has the habit of checking social media like first thing in the morning? I am guilty of that. Uh, social media companies have nailed the habit loops around their users by sending them these notifications, nudges, uh, allowing them to discover and engage with the latest content. The more you engage, the more they can perfect their growth loops. Using the same analogy of habit loops, consider how a B2B SaaS might do it. Let's take Zoom's example again. Free 40 minute of video calling, then more premium features once you get used to the simplicity of the product. Once you use the product as a, as a, as a user or an attendee, then because, and because it's so simple to use, you then started hosting more uh, meetings, more video calls, right? And then now your entire ecosystem or your entire team has adopted the product. So what do you do now? Now you know, need more recordings, you need more integ integrations, you need more call transcripts and all the all other premium features for which you needed to pay. What you see on the right hand side of the slide is Amazon's famous growth, growth model or growth flywheel. Back in the day when Amazon started as an internet company, they only offered delivery of books to begin with. Over time, they added more categories, but Amazon had this vision of becoming the everything store. So how would they get a customer to come to Amazon for all their needs? They realized to, make, to get more customer traffic on Amazon's websites, they needed to add more categories. That opened up the idea of creating a marketplace. Amazon invited third-party sellers to sell more of their products, uh, creating a larger category base for users to choose from and more options to choose from. As more users started coming to, uh, coming to Amazon to buy, Amazon could negotiate even better prices from their sellers, creating this low cost structure and lower prices for their, for their customer, which got the customer hooked. That's how Amazon used user psychology to discover their growth model. And experiments are widely used tactic, a tactical tool to uncover that user psychology. What is an experiment? An experiment is essentially a, to, a tool, a test to determine the veracity of the hypothesis that you set. An experiment is the fastest way to get closer to the truth about a user's, user's behavior. It's also something that I call a minimal viable test or an MBT. We'll talk a little bit more about MBTs in the following section, but before, I wanted, uh, before that, I wanted to address a few notions about experiments. Experiments is a very loosely used term in product companies. It is very easy to brush off a project that did not meet its objectives as an experiment. Well, my opinion is not, every failed project cannot be called an experiment. Similarly, as against popular opinion, I believe running experiments is not cheap and we should not run them all the time. Running experiments is time intensive. It takes a lot of effort, resources, and you know, you know which are run, uh, expended in running the 
in, in first of all, design the experiment and then analyzing the results. All these resources could have been spent in building a new feature, right? Therefore, you got to be very careful of how you run experiments. Experiments when, should be run when you have a goal and a problem to solve. It sounds pretty basic, right? But it gets forgotten very easily. It's, it's easy to get carried away, but, but an experiment should be aligned with a goal that you're trying to hit, say for your quarter, or you have, have uncovered a problem, that, uh, a problem to hit that goal. Let's consider again Amazon's example that we were talking about. At high level, Amazon wanted to be an everything store. That was their goal. The problem they probably started with was acquiring more users and getting them hooked to Amazon for all their needs. The second is defining a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an idea that can be tested to answer a problem or a question. It is a statement that's backed by evidence and that you believe to be true to answer a problem. A hypothesis is not a statement of prediction or, or what will happen if you did something. Again, like let's consider Amazon's case. Um, the hypothesis could have been something like uh, if Amazon was able to add more categories, they will be able to acquire more users because that had been their observation in the past, right? With the, with the other categories that they continue to expand before they created the marketplace. Um, the next thing is about, you know, the, about experiments is the experiment should have a goal of improving the product itself and user experience and not just to hit a goal, uh, not just to uh, hit a metric. Um, if you merely try to hit a metric, chances are you will, you will end up at a local maxima. But you try, if you try to improve the product for a user while trying to solve a problem, metrics will improve as an outcome. Remember, at the heart of PLG is still the user experience that matters the most. If you just throw in an experiment, say like something like an intercom nudge or, or a notification to bring the user back into the product, that might tell you a little bit about the user behavior, but it's not enough to create a habit loop around the user or you know to keep the user engaged with your product when amazon you know solved that problem of user acquisition they continued to make the product better by adding reviews comparisons etc that, that led to the stickiness right uh, apart from that uh, experiments are also run to overcome human biases as pms it's easy to uh, overestimate your ideas based on some um, anecdotal data and evidence uh, but you know the truth is experiments cannot be based on a hunch. You need to have clearly defined metrics to judge the success of your experiments before you've even started the design, designing the experiment. And best of us fall for it, honestly. When the growth head of MailChimp was appointed to uh, improve, the, uh, improve activation for them, uh, increasing the activation, they ran experiments for a year only to conclude that the product itself needed major refactoring of its editor before they aim for higher activation. You know, they spent six months to change that editor, make it much more intuitive for the, product, uh, for the user. And then they started working on driving more activation. To isolate uh, external influences, uh, you should uh, run experiments. Like experiments should not always have this you know, huge goal of, uh, you know, trying to improve something, but an experiment can be run with the goal of only trying to uncover um, some product labor. So for example, did your signups go up randomly last month? Uh, do you know why it happened? If not, you can run an experiment and that's a good enough goal to understand why did it even go up. With some clarity on when to run experiments, uh, let's look at what qualifies as an experiment, also known as the minimal viable test. Uh, once you have a clear goal and clearly defined hypothesis, list a few ideas to test the hypothesis. Mind you, there can be many ideas to solve a problem, but there should be only one test to run, uh, to, to run and test a an hypothesis. If you find your hypothesis trying to answer a lot of questions, a lot of assumptions at the same time, you need to distill uh, it to answer only one question or one hypothesis, uh, uh, one assumption at a time. The test you run to prove this distal hypothesis is your MVT. Thus, there can be multiple tests that, uh, that, that can be run uh, to solve the problem. And the way you prioritize these tests, uh, the way you prioritize these tests depend on how, sorry, uh, the way you prioritize these tests depend how you, how you, uh, how do you, how much resources do you have, how's the experiment design and what is the goal. I often get this question, how do you generate ideas, Priya, uh, for the test that you want to run? 
Well, my answer is some some form of data. As a growth PM, I re- lean heavily into my conversion, activation, trial funnels, and also speak to the client-facing teams and lifecycle marketing teams to understand any trends that they have been observing. Let me give you an example of an experiment I ran recently. My goal for the quarter was to increase net MR retention. Net MR retention is a function of acquisition, expansion, and churn. We further narrowed down the goal to focus on expansion of our user base. Expansion can be achieved by upselling or activating customers faster. When I looked into data, I realized there is an opportunity to activate a certain section of users faster. So that was my problem, that some users are not activating as fast as another section of users. Then we started ideating about some ways we could solve that problem, i.e. by you know, helping users discover uh, that feature, that set of features faster, or helping them adopt, or guiding them, just about just uh, helping them learn more about it, or guiding about how, what the feature does. You see, there were multiple ideas of how that problem of activation could be solved. Uh, and then we narrowed down on one. Next came the stage of prioritization. And again, this was backed by evidence I formed about, uh, I formed around the hypothesis that users are not seeing some of our features and that's why they don't activate faster. So the real, pro- the real hypothesis was about that a user and the user is not able to discover it well. I'm running an experiment to test only that particular hypothesis now. The other key thing to note about MBTs is having a clearly defined success metric, like I mentioned before. This goes back to the idea of running experiments on hunches. Just because you think something will work isn't enough. You should note the metrics as well as the goal that you're going to hit for that metric that determines whether the test is successful or not. The last thing you want for an experiment is to be inconclusive. Failed experiment is still okay, but you will know if the experiment has failed only if you set a success metric to begin with, right? For the test I'm running, the success metric we want to we set was to measure the percentage increase of users activating versus the control group uh, who activated basically in the 20, in, in, in a certain time frame. We, I set it at 28 days. And we also set a goal for it. Thus, if you focus on, on your MBTs, you get closer to the heart of the question. Can you predict success before you launch a different a new feature? I believe the answer is yes. With the right approach, you can make stronger, stronger prediction about your chance of success and reduce the chance of your failure. Often forgotten, but analyzing results is by far the most important aspect of running experiments. If you're not able to extract any positive or negative learnings about the experiment, there's nothing to feedback into your growth model for it to become even more repeatable and systematic over time, right? That's what we are trying to get. Um, If however, experiment has been a success, you might decide to double down on the project, apply it to other areas of the product or prioritize some other work in the backlog. So let's look at some points to keep in mind when analyzing the results of the experiment. Success or failure. You, you would think, you know, this is like such a no brainer, but yes, when, when, you, when you set a success metric and a goal for that metric, and then you don't meet that goal, how do you determine whether the experiment was a success or a failure? You know, only tw- less than 25% of experiments succeed, but not all are failing, not, not all of the rest are failures. Uh, in one of my experiments, we ended up moving a metric, but not as much as we had uh, set the goal for. It was a really difficult decision to determine whether the experiment was even a success. Because if we declared it a success, that meant we were ready to allocate more development time to it, to build a full-fledged solution. Therefore, it sounds easy, but it's not, and you really need to be very, very careful about them. Of course, the why, most important step is to figure out the potential reasons for success and failure. Was it the cohort size? Was it you know, a recent product launch or the length of the experiment? Another case happened with me recently where we tried a behavioral experiment that was a roaring success. Uh, but later we realized there was something else that was released in the same time frame in another domain that might have contributed to the success as well. Lesson learned, but you know, that's how, and honestly, like we, we thought, we never thought that would have been, uh, that would have affected the success. So yeah, you've got to be very, very careful of how you do it. And measuring correctly, again, uh, you know, I'm almost covered in this previous example I was talking about, but you know, you need to be very careful of how the test, how many tests you want to run simultaneously, what tests are running simultaneously, such that the results of one do not impact the results of another. In fact, you shouldn't run tests that can remotely even influence each other. 
data teams are your best bets and they should guide you through how to measure correctly and uh, whether they know about any other tests that's are, that are running in the background as well. I partner with them all the time to determine the length of the test, the size of the cohorts, et cetera. That will give us the most statistically significant result in the sh shortest possible time. The next step is determining product levers. An experiment might be a successful or su success or failure, but it should help you determine some sort of levers that created a positive or negative impact on your metrics. Modulating these, even if you understand these levers and you know it, you are it, it's it's you don't understand whether it was a success or failure. If you understand these levers, it helps you. It gives you an opportunity to modulate these levers further to design newer experiments. So take a very close look at them. Accuracy of the results. An experiment's context determines everything. Uh, note how close or far you are to even the prediction of the success metric. If, if the success metric itself, like you're absolutely far off from the success metric, probably you don't even understand all the variables that go into your model and you might need to reevaluate and take a step back and think, uh, you know, what should you be doing, whether you are even on, on the right track. Um, it happened to me very recently, again, we, where we had to actually change the definition of how we looked at one of the metrics. I will not talk about it much, but yes, we had to do that. Like, and, and that was a, uh, almost, it affected a, a lot of other things as well. Um, the last piece is communication of the results, um, often overlooked again, but I believe this is the most important aspect of running an experiment. Like, what did you even do if you learned an experiment did not com communicate it across your company? Because your whole idea is that you want to become product-led, right? Imagine learning something about your paywalls through an experiment and not sharing with the, with the team who continue to use some low-performing paywalls. Even if your test was successful, you have failed because you failed to drive that positive change, you know, which could have uh, added to, your, to you becoming a product-led company. And that's all for today. Uh, I hope that so, so I, I, what I shared was helpful to you. Um, uh, and I'm ready for some more questions if you have any for me. Oh, that's awesome. Well, as we wait maybe for people to throw some Q&A inside the Q&A panel, uh, maybe I'll ask a question here, a, a couple and kind of get things started. Um, I know you mentioned earlier, like product like growth is not just a, a, a growth PM's kind of job. It's actually the, you know, the overall company's kind of job to kind of advance that product led growth. I'm curious, like how you enroll other people in that activity, how you get them engaged in thinking that this isn't just your job, that it's actually theirs as well. So maybe share some thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. And it, I, I'll accept that it is not, again, an overnight process. Um, you have to create that kind of thought lead leadership. Like if you have a, a team that has been formulated to drive growth, you need to um, create that kind of understanding, shared understanding company wide. The way we do it is obviously setting up processes and uh, setting up these monthly cadences as well. Uh, when we share about what some of the initiatives that we are driving as a team and uh, again sharing our goal what what is our goal what what, what are we being driven by uh, we open up uh, forums for them to share any ideas that they think uh, could make sense uh, to be driven via the product and uh, you know some of the observations that they have seen uh, or you know if customer success for example has been seen some so, so uh, I'll give you an example um, uh, our customer success uh, observed that our users like to pay uh, monthly and not annually. And, uh, you know, they, they came up to us and they, they, they said, you know, can we do something and implement so that such that it's easier in the product for the user to see and make that buy decision quickly. So it, it's about creating that shared understanding that first of all, I am open to your ideas uh, and we need to make our product a compelling uh, solution so that we have the least amount of manual, uh, you know, uh, touch. Yeah, well, that's great. That's great. I, I, I know you're in a, a, an industry that's faced a lot of tough challenges over the past year here with COVID in particular. And I know you talked a little bit about um, discovering that sort of habit and growth loops to, to drive that sort of growth model. Um, how has that model had to adapt uh, for you over the course of this year based on the changes that we saw, obviously, with COVID and restaurants and lockdowns and everything else kind of going on? Curious how that has that model had to adapt in what ways? Um, yeah, so um, I would say uh, the growth model had to change in the sense of 
you know where in, initially uh, it, it changed with the with the goal basically uh initially the goal was to you know uh, acquire more users and then also retain them um when uh when when, when the uh, when COVID happened and we saw there were so many restaurant closures, right? The mm -hmm. goal changed from just, you know, just going for the land grab. It became about providing more and more value to the users so that the users who were there, they stuck with us. And uh, that meant providing more value in terms of what we were already offering to them on the plans they were. We actually did a hiring feature because hiring it became such a huge you know, problem in, in the restaurant space. So we have uh, launched a hiring feature and there are a couple of other initiatives that we did just to deliver more value before we even went back uh, to ask uh, for, for anything in return. So that, that's yeah. something that I pointed out before as well. You have to deliver value first before you can ask for more money. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. Um, one question I see here from the audience. Uh, one of the slides mentioned PLG companies have large numbers of low paying customers. Why is that relevant? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so I would say the reason for that is, uh, so one is an outcome uh, because you offer this free trial um, uh, and a freemium model, you end up getting uh, uh, lower paying customers. But as a company, I also want a, a larger uh, size of lower paying customers or at least a larger size, not lower paying, but I want a larger size of customers so that I can even run my experiments, right? The experiments, will have statistical significance only when uh, I run it on a larger base of users. Uh, if I just run an experiment on less than 100, I mean, don't even do it, don't even bother. So that's also the reason why I need uh, a larger number of users to even experiment with. Yeah, that's a good point, great point. A um, couple of other questions maybe I'll ask just as we kind of get closer to wrapping up. Um, I'm really curious about that relationship. I mean, you mentioned earlier about being kind of remaining open to other people's ideas and suggestions and contributions to your growth plans. But how do you balance essentially that relationship between um, the growth product manager and the product manager? And maybe the, I guess, sometimes the battles or the fights that come up between this is my territory or your territory or my domain or your domain or my product or your product. And then just sort of that, how do you, how do you, you know, massage that relationship and get, get the most value out of that in terms of the, the two teams working together well? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. And there, again, is no easy answer to it. It is uh, forever a battle of priorities. Uh, but the good thing is, again, if a company imbibes that value of becoming product-led growth, and if it becomes you know, a top-down approach, uh, you get that buy-in from your peers much more easier is what I have observed. Um, our company is uh, you know, proactively trying to, uh, you know, again, imbibe those values. And during our roadmap sessions, for example, uh, on a more tactical uh, uh, tactical level, um, during our roadmap sessions, if there's something that I'm doing that needs help or involvement from another team, um, they are much more open now, just because they know that we have this goal uh, of driving, for example, net MRR retention. And whatever I am doing, uh, and if they can support me, we could achieve that goal in a much faster, uh, you know, quicker way. So yeah. I think, yeah, it's always a discussion and, uh, you know, a, a point of prioritization. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's a clear winner always. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it wouldn't be. I think it was going to be a tough question to answer. Um, yeah. We're going to take one last question here on the side. Uh, what should we focus on to create habits is the question that came up. Okay. Uh, so, um, interesting again, uh, to create habits. I will go back to my slide, which says, you know, really, really deeply understand your user. Uh, and that will require you to run uh, more experiments and really lean into the data a lot. Use your data as your anvil. Um, you know, I, I personally spend a lot of time just looking at data, uh, trying to, even with my data team, trying to make sense of some of the th things that have happened in the past as well. Um, I don't think you can go to the user to understand the user psychology. It is difficult and therefore it's, it, it's, it's a process. I don't think I answered that question very well, but yeah, it is what it is. Okay, we do our best, we do our best. I really appreciate you taking the time, Priya, and sharing your thoughts on this. It's been great to get to know you through this and also to 
you know, read some of your great tweets on the topic, uh, you know, and other kinds of things that you share on that side. So again, really, really appreciate the, the content today and the contributions. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you around again a little bit more in our community. And for yeah. anybody that's interested, uh, as I mentioned, we do have ongoing conversations happening within the community on this side. Um, if you uh, didn't get a chance to ask a question or something comes up later that you want to ask, uh, make available that link. It's available on, again, on the homepage directly from the site. And as a reminder too, if you're found today helpful, we also have another great event coming up in October on how to run product at scale, which is our product excellence summit here at Product Board. And I encourage you to check that out as well. There's information as well on the uh, product makers community for that.